Dixon is with us to discuss the 1581 work, The Devil's Bagpipe, The True Life of Martin Luther, just recently translated by Father Nixon, which modifies and corrects the popular but inaccurate myth of Martin Luther. Today, on The Simple Truth, we consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the pure, strong, chaste heart of St. Joseph. Again, the book we're going to be looking at today, The Devil's Bagpipe, The True Life of Martin Luther, a 1581 text by James Lang, uh, recently translated by Father Robert Nixon. You can get it at Census Fidelium Press. That's censusfidelliumpress.com. Uh, Father Robert Nixon, uh, he, well, before we, in, before we welcome him in, a quick introduction. Father Robert Nixon, OSB, a monk of the Abbey of the Most Holy Trinity, New Norcia, Western Australia, where he serves as director of the Institute for Benedictine Studies. He's a retreat master and liturgist whose interests include medieval Latin literature, especially the lives of the saints. Father Robert Nixon, welcome back to The Simple Truth. Thank you for being with us today. How are you? Thank you very much, Jim. It's uh, fantastic to be with you once more and to have the opportunity of sharing this uh, very important early biography of Luther, which really um, sheds a lot of light upon the kind of man he was and where his ideas sprang from. Yes, yeah, very important. Yeah, thanks for being with us today. And will you get us started by leading us in an opening prayer? Certainly. Uh, In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and our Holy Father, St. Benedict, we ask that the wisdom of Almighty God may inspire us, that the strength of his Son may inflame us, and that the learning of the Holy Spirit may guide us in our discussion. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much, Father. So um, right in the beginning here of the text in your translator's note, um, you you write about how this was written uh, by a learned and devout Scotsman, James Lang, and uh, that this work was published in Latin in 1581, uh, but penned uh, some years even before that, originally in the French language. Um, And so... um, This biography of James Lang, why is this biography able to be trusted in your view? What factors show that it is worthy of belief? So James Lang was born only about 15 years after Martin Luther himself. He was uh, born to a devout Catholic family and showed great intelligence. And so he went to France to study. And that was the natural move for a um, for a person of outstanding intellectual and academic abilities at the time. So this meant that he was positioned in very close proximity in a chronological sense to the events which he's actually talking about. So what he is talking about happened very much within living memory. A lot of it he would have been... Uh, a first-hand witness to, um, I mean, a first-hand witness slightly geographically removed in the sense that he was in France rather than Germany at the time. But he was um, seeing these things unfold as he was writing. And he was writing um, as a Scotsman in France from a kind of neutral point of view. So he wasn't Um, a German who was living under the reign of terror, uh, which emerged as a consequence of Martin Luther. So he wasn't bound to to comply with with this kind of uh, dialogue or this uh, discourse of, of praising Luther as a hero. Rather, he was taking an objective perspective. And so I think... This biography which he produced, which came to him from the basis of eyewitness accounts of what was common public knowledge at the time, it was uh, given the official approval of the University of Paris. And I think this speaks very strongly in its favour. Now, of course, 
the University of Paris was a Catholic institution. But we shouldn't conclude from that that therefore it is biased because the University of Paris consisted of the, the most learned people of the time, of all of Europe. And so although it was Catholic, at the same time it was very interested in objectivity of truth, in standards of scholarship, in historical veracity. And so we have this, uh, this wonderful biography, um, given the appro approval of the University of Paris, written only a few decades after the death of Luther, written drawing upon living eyewitnesses' uh, accounts and within living memory. So it's impossible that within such a sp short space of time, um, any serious falsehoods could have crept into it. So I think for all of these reasons, this biography uh, of Luther should be given the utmost credence. And some people object, of course, and say, well, it was written by a Catholic, so of course it's biased. But the fact of the matter is, at the time, people were either for Luther or for the Catholic Church. There was like no completely neutral um, historian at the time. A person was either a Catholic or a Lutheran. And um, from this point of view, to say that it's not true because it's written by a Catholic makes no sense at all. Um, any more than to say that something written by a Lutheran is not true, because of course it, that is presenting a particular version of the events. So I, I believe that, that James Lang, a Scotsman living in France, um, was uniquely qualified to talk about these events which were going on right before his eyes during his lifetime uh, in Germany, which of course was was not so far away from where he was um, positioned himself. Yes, yeah, it's a fascinating read. Father Robert Nixon is with us talking about the devil's bagpipe, the true life of Martin Luther, a biography written uh, by James Lang back in uh, 1581 comes to us now in this new edition translated by Father Robert Nixon. You can get it at censusfidelliumpress.com, censusfidelliumpress.com. In the, um, again, also in the, uh, the translator's note at the beginning, you write, this is a work which all Catholics and indeed all people interested in history should read for it substantially modifies and corrects the popular but inaccurate myth of Luther, replacing it with a more balanced, credible, and truthful account of the life, character, and motives of a man who gravely distorted the gospel of Christ and did untold damage to his one true Catholic church. Um, and, um, you know, before we get into uh, the history that is laid out here in the biography, the truth of it, um, let's talk about that myth, that popular myth. Uh, many Catholics, uh, many people know only the, the Protestant hagiography version of the life of Luther, uh, that he was troubled by pondering yeah. on theological questions, that he bravely nailed his 95 theses to the door of a cathedral, yet it's largely fiction. How is it that the personality and actions of Luther have come to be so misunderstood and misrepresented? Yes. So the version which most people, uh, including Catholics, accept of the life and character of Luther um, actually doesn't bear much relation to historical fact. It, it is largely a um, 18th, 19th century Protestant myth that originated, that here was Luther trapped away in this Augustinian monastery, pondering questions of salvation and how one obtained salvation in relation to God and tormented by his awareness of the sinfulness of the human condition and um, the ineffectiveness of human works and coming to the conclusion that, no, it was by faith alone. And this, in fact, is, is not true at all because in the period in which Luther lived, he came from a scholastic background. There was a lot of free discussion about the details of how salvation worked and so forth. Different opinions were published, and at an academic level, they, you know, diversity was actually 
quite acceptable. It was part of that scholastic culture. And we know that Aquinas and Duns Scotus disagreed over numerous things. Um, this was how the scholastics proceeded in their studies. They actually indulged or, uh, or uh, went into different possible opinions. And, you know, when Martin Luther published these opinions, which were initially attacking the use of indulgences, um, he was fully supported by the Augustinians in Germany. And this is something which people don't realize. They seem to think he was rebelling against the establishment. The fact is that the um, Augustinians in Germany and, and a lot of the church in Germany was actually supporting uh, Martin Luther from the very beginning. So he wasn't taking this huge, bold step that people were imagining. He was actually going around publicly um, preaching his uh, 95 Theses. He was challenging people to um, partake in public debates with him. So there was no, uh, no sense at all of this um, personal uh, conscience troubling him and causing him to take this bold step at the risk of his personal safety. On the contrary, he was making his own career by being a controversial within, it's fair enough to say, within the scholastic tradition of public debate. And he was doing it with the full support of the German Augustinians. And the interesting thing is, the reason they were supporting this view is we'll right actually back. driven we'll right by back. fighting. Truth talking with Father Robert Nixon today, OSB, a monk of the Abbey of the Most Holy Trinity, New Norcia, Western Australia. Very blessed to have him with us, talking about his new translation uh, on this edition of an old biography written by James Lang, but at a very uh, vital time, not long after um, Luther, um, Martin Luther, and so a biography written very close to the time of Martin Luther. Uh, James Lang being a contemporary with him and writing us uh, this text. 1581 uh, is when um, when it was uh, published, I guess, and, and and in Latin, and now translated to us all these many years later that we can benefit from it, uh, thanks to the good work by Father Robert Nixon and Census Fidelium Press, who is um, putting this out for us, censusfideliumpress.com, to get a copy, The Devil's Bagpipe, The True Life of Martin Luther, again, censusfideliumpress.com. Father, we left off, you were talking about uh, the reason that the German Augustinians were supporting Luther in the very beginning uh, of how all of this un unraveled. And I guess I just want to ask you about that because this yeah. is a fascinating uh, chapter in the book Indeed. entitled The Controversy Over Indulgences and Luther's 95 yeah. Theses. And um, yeah, he was actually being, it seems, um, as we go through the account, um, really summoned um, by this vicar general of the Augustinians uh, for the German province at the time, this Father Johann uh, von Staupitz, but um, but yeah, explain this to us uh, about um, because a lot yeah. of people so Luther's objections to indulgences often misunderstood as having a theological basis. Yet the original reason was that his own community of Augustinians, which had traditionally derived large incomes from the sale of indulgences, lost this role to the Dominicans. What is the role in monetary considerations in Luther's original polemics? So um, the, the Augustinians traditionally had the job of um, administering papal indulgences in Germany, and they made a lot of money from doing this. Now, it happened that Pope Leo X, instead, he let one of the archbishops pick who would be responsible, and they picked the Dominicans instead of the Augustinians. And the Augustinians lost a lot of income because of this, and they were furious. And so... Martin Luther, with the support of the leader of the Augustinians in Germany, went about attacking indulgences in their entirety. And this, is, this was basically the reason he did it. It was nothing to do with theology originally. It was purely to do with the fact that they missed out on the prophets. And the prophets were going to someone else. So Martin Luther came to have a strong dislike of Dominicans, particularly 
Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor. He said he couldn't give a, you know, a whatever for any of Thomas Aquinas' writings. And now, you know, you think about these things, they involved people making a donation according to their means and making a serious commitment, serious act of contrition. And there's nothing to be um, objected to in all of that. And Luther misrepresented it as a selling of forgiveness of sins. It's not a selling of forgiveness of sins. It was, uh, on the contrary, that a person does an act of charity showing their penitence, and then they are, are given this remission for the temporal punishment of sins. So, yeah, a very important point, you know, and, and our version of history makes a lot of Martin Luther objecting to indulgences, but, you know, it, it's not accurate at all. He objected to losing the money for the Augustinians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as James Lang writes in this chapter, he says, there was no one who did not recognize the granting of these indulgences to be a most praiseworthy work of mercy, for it resulted both in the remission of many sins and in encouraging the general populace to give alms generously according to their means. It cannot be denied that some of those who were responsible for collecting and processing the offerings misappropriated what was entrusted to them and did not properly follow the procedures laid out in the papal documents. However, such regrettable cases certainly did not undermine the integrity and the good results of the work as a whole. Uh, definitely a different picture than what we normally get about this time and what motivated Luther. And, and in talking about what motivated Luther, in the chapter prior to this, it talks about his academic career, his attempt to be appointed as a cardinal, it's not generally known that while still in his early 20s, Luther firmly believed that he was about to be made a cardinal and even asked the Pope about this. To what extent did Luther's personal ambitions drive him in this work? Yeah, so what happened, the situation was complex with the Augustinians in Germany. Uh, Luther wasn't actually their leader, but he was kind of appointed as a representative by a, a group of Augustinian uh, monasteries. And he went, he, he sorted out the trouble that was there, the disagreements, and he went to Rome to see the Pope about some issues. And at this stage, someone might have suggested to him, or he might have come up with it himself, but he firmly believed that he was on the verge of being made a cardinal. And it didn't happen. He eventually, he, he, he raised it directly with the Pope. And the Pope told him, you know, you just concentrate on being an Augustinian canon for the time being. And uh, this was something which really spurred uh, Luther's fury against Rome. He felt that he'd been thwarted. But his ambition comes out in numerous other respects, you know, because he always said one of the things quoted before he gave a speech, he would make this um type of proclamation, and I'll just read a tiny bit of it for you. He would say, most talking about the Pope, Most blessed Father, I prostrate myself before you and cast myself before the feet of your holiness. All that I am and all that I have done, I offer to you. And so he went on with this big flattering um, diatribe, but he was prepared to jump ship at any moment. If he was offered an archbishopric or a cardinal's hat, he would have jumped back on board with the Catholics. And he made this perfectly clear. So he kept his options open about, you know, reunifying with the Catholic Church. If that wasn't going to work out, if he wasn't going to get the promotions he was after, then he was going to start his own show. Yeah, I mean, clearly the description that we get in this biography is that he was a man, a true manifestation of the deadly sin of pride um, to, the, to the extreme. And so really it's a meditation even um, on, on that sin of pride as we, as we go through his life. Again, the biography shows um, the character of Luther as extremely proud, manipulative, and ambitious, as well as inclined to gluttony and drunkenness he was also violent and prone to using foul language. What are some examples of this? Well, you know, the manipulative aspect is seen uh, when there was a new emperor and Martin Luther went out of his way to, to befriend this emperor. 
um, you know, to flatter him and everything. And he did this also with other members of the nobility in Germany to get them on side. So he would kind of play whatever character he need, he felt he needed to play to get their support. Now, um, about this gluttony and drunkenness, we have a, 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 a detailed description of what happened when he was on his way to the Diet of Worms. Now, the Diet of Worms was a meeting that was summoned by the emperor in Germany uh, to consider what Luther was doing. It ended up actually condemning him. But on the way, it says, um, Luther traveled with a great procession of wagons a whole, with a whole group of his cronies. And as they went on the way, they visited every single tavern and wayside inn along their course. So this horrendous and shocking spectacle uh, caused amazement and wonder amongst all the people. So they would all get completely drunk and then they would, um, they would go on with dancing and singing. And you remember Luther at this stage was still wearing his Augustinian habit. So he was carousing uh, in pubs, as we call them in Australia, or as in bars, as you would call them in the United States, and, you know, singing, dancing, basically making a fool of himself. And it was a whole, a whole you know, uh, crew of people following him along on this uh, course, which was quite a scandal throughout the whole country. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And then, um, yeah, and it wasn't um, long after that where then we have this episode where he um, so-called marries, um, I guess, um, a nun. And so um, this would have been adultery, obviously. Um, he, him being a priest, um, basically going completely against his vows and, and also she going against her vows. And, um, and yeah, we, we just see this unraveling in the moral life of Luther as we progress through the story. Um, he just gets more and more depraved and takes more and more people with him. And then you see this not just being manifested yeah. in him and those around him, but then exploding into the culture. Um, it really is a, a yeah. damning uh, biography of, um, of it, it what the is. reality really was so, on the ground. Mm hmm. We, we see in Luther that as he goes along, he gets in, his ego gets increasingly inflated. He eventually starts to see himself as a new Messiah, as if only he, out of all the doctors and saints of the church, have actually got the truth of the gospel. And, um, you know, I believe probably a contributing factor to this was his drinking. I mean, there can't be too much doubt that he was basically an alcoholic. And this led to mental deterioration, moral deterioration. And he ended his life not in a very good way. The causes of his death are basically not exactly known. Consequence of his lifestyle of, of, of gluttony and, uh, and, and excessive drinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, um, um, the, the, the fundamental difference um, between Catholicism and Lutheranism might be described as one of positivity compared to negativity. Uh, Luther believed that human nature and even the created world are fundamentally evil and entirely corrupt, whereas Catholics believe they are basically good, although impaired by the effects of original sin. How did Luther's own personality and disposition contribute to this warped view of humanity and the world? So we, we see this warped view in a lot of the things that he said. You know, he, he said things like human beings are basically a pile of dung. He said that we live in a world, we live in the devil's world. We're breathing the devil's air. He was kind of had this ultra negative point of view of the world and of human nature. Now, we sometimes do find elements of that negative point of view in other medieval writers. But I think he took it very literally and took it too far. And he was probably drawing um, on an element of introspection. You know, if a person comes to the conclusion that human nature is only capable of evil and only wants to do evil, what does it say about their own heart? And um, I think this contrast with the Catholic point of view, we recognize the effects of original sin uh, both on human nature and on on the world in which we live. But nevertheless, we say it's created by God. It's fundamentally good. 
um, that if a good thing is impaired, it doesn't cease to be good. It doesn't become rubbish or a pile of dung. But on the contrary, um, it, it's just in need of that restoration. And I think this is one of the wonderful things about the, the Christian approach. We believe, yes, we need the grace of God to do good works, but we've already got that grace. We've got that grace by being born as human beings and also by being baptized. So, you know, human beings, uh, we do remain in control of our actions. We're not slaves to evil, as we'll be Luther right there. Stay tuned. believe. simple truth talking with father robert and nixon today osb sharing with us a work that has been recently translated by him entitled the devil's bagpipe the true life of martin luther it's a biography that goes back to 1581 again just newly translated you can get it from census fidelium press census fidelium press.com is the place to go um, Father, before actually, real quick, before we get back into this, um, just want to let people know um, about the the only phone company, mobile phone company in the U.S. today uh, that is Catholic. It's iCatholic Mobile. So if you have a cell phone, if you have cell phone service, it's a great idea to switch over to iCatholic Mobile. Not only would you then be getting your cell service from a Catholic source you can feel good about, but also iCatholic Mobile gives a portion of every dollar earned to the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network, which means when you subscribe to iCatholic Mobile, you are helping to fund all the programs on the Station of the Cross, including the simple truth. We greatly appreciate you switching over to iCatholic Mobile. You can join today by going to iCatholicMobile.com. That's iCatholicMobile.com. Father, where we left off, you were talking about this difference between Catholicism and Luther, Lutheranism, where Luther got it wrong, this negative view uh, concerning human nature, the created world, um, and, and, and this image of the dung heap. And, and so he, he also has this way um, that, that is famously uh, understood of describing how grace works, where it's pretty much snow covering the dung heap. We still remain uh, this dung heap, this really terrible view of, of uh, human nature. But uh, the, the Catholic view um, would be that actually uh, by the redemption of Christ applied to us in baptism, uh, that the dung heap would actually be uh, transformed, if we want to use that image, from the inside out, right? And so, um, so it's not that we're just covered up, and we still have this um, this uh, this evil nature to us. No, our Lord Jesus has come to redeem us at the very heart. Um, anything else you want to um, explain to us with respect to all of this? Yeah, no, I, th I think you've put it very well there. You know, our Catholic belief is that, you know, we we are fundamentally good and we might have a little bit of dung on us, which is removed by baptism and by the sacrifice of Christ and by good works and penance and so forth. But fundamentally, we're underneath at the bottom, we're good. Whereas, of course, the Lutheran point of view is un underneath it all, we are that dung, which I think is... It's actually a, a really psychologically damaging approach and also kind of insulting to God as our creator. Yeah, yeah, well put. All right. And so um, it's also sometimes the case that elements of Protestant thinking stealthily enter into Catholic thought and practice. What are some examples of a sort of crypto Protestantism which Catholics need to be cautious about? So I think one particular thing is the idea that people basically make theological and ecclesiastical decisions for themselves, you know, and our church tradition is we have a hierarchy, we have doctors of the church who, who deal with these different complex issues. And we might say Lutheran's approach is, you know, anyone's opinion is just as good as anyone else's opinion. You know, and we can see the consequences of that sometimes, you know, where you say, oh, well, we should take a, some people almost think the church should be run like a democracy, which of course it isn't because it's dealing with truth. And uh, a church can't be run like a democracy any more than a hospital can be run like a democracy. Uh, there, are, there are experts in these fields. Also, I think the misunderstanding of scripture, 
the treating of scripture as if it is the be all and the end all as if it contains all the answers to everything now for catholics we we certainly venerate scripture and revere it but at the same time we recognize that it is part of tradition and not the other way around so that we we need to read scripture in communion with the church so uh, another thing also is a tendency to moral relativism so one of the great things of the catholic faith i believe is the clarity of our moral teachings we say you know this is wrong this isn't wrong whereas in protestantism everything is in a kind of gray area which i believe is is not helpful to anyone so i think as a church we need to be careful of these things even in the way we do our liturgy we need to to make our liturgy you know the catholic liturgy is mystery grandeur splendor and so forth whereas the protestant liturgy is all about the pastor teaching the people whereas um the teaching aspect is only secondary in catholic liturgy so all of these things and you know sometimes people have said to me they feel like some catholic churches are almost like protestant churches so we need to be very careful very conscious of what is particularly catholic and hang on to that because we know it is what's given to us by jesus christ yeah what what is your take on i remember noticing this back in 2017 which would have been the uh, 500th uh, year anniversary of Luther and his 95 theses and, and all of that. Um, and, and, and so very strangely, as that approached, it seemed like um, the Catholic Church uh, leadership, even at the Vatican, um, it seemed to be that there was a sort of a, a celebration, or I guess maybe you could say a commemoration, seemingly though in a, in a quite a positive way, about all of this, um, there was even a, uh, a postage stamp uh, that was uh, put out there by the Vatican. This is uh, now from Vatican News um, in, in talking about it. This is very, very odd. I remember seeing it at the time, um, but it, um, it basically was saying that the, um, the stamp itself, um, it had images of um of the the uh it depicts this this is precisely what it says it says it depicts in the foreground jesus crucified and in the background a golden and timeless view of the city of wittenberg where on the church door martin luther put up his 95 theses on october 31st 1517 marking the start of the reformation it says in the stamp martin luther is depicted on the left side of the cross kneeling in a penitential disposition and holding the bible source and destination of his doctrine on the other side is philip melon melon i'm not sure how you pronounce that theologian and friend of martin luther one of the main protagonists of the reform it says who is holding uh, the augsburg confession the first official public presentation of the principles of protestantism written by him this seems to be a bad choice by the vatican to put out this stamp um, but what about this idea of kind of um, looking back on it as sort of a positive or commemorating it or celebrating it in any way? Look, I, I, I think that is a great mistake because fundamentally Luther is is a heretic. I mean, he, and we wouldn't celebrate, you know, the anniversary of another heretic, you know, Valerian, Arius, um, Nestor, someone like that, would we? Um, so I think in the same way we should do this. You know, at, I mean, at the same time, it's it's reasonable to say that as a whole, we could say that there were some good people who happened to live in Germany at the time who got caught up in what was going on, you know. And we could say that at the present stage, there are also lots of good Christians who happen to be Lutherans because they're born into Lutheran families, you know. So we don't want to say that they're all terrible but at the same time, um, I think that was that is actually something of a mistake because it's actually falling into um, into the Protestant version of events. And you know, we we basically still feel officially he is still a heretic. And um, I, yeah, so I'm I'm a little bit confused about that. But then you know, I'm only I'm only a monk. I don't make decisions at this kind of level. 
And I I don't disguise my point of view. I've, I've given this book to, to Lutherans, you know, and they, they think it's quite interesting because mm-hmm. they often haven't come across this before, whether, whether the, obviously they probably don't accept it in the same way, but it is a historically important document. And I think when we're dealing with other faiths, we shouldn't try to conceal our differences. We should be quite open about them. And this doesn't imply personal disrespect to the people of other faiths. It, this is actually honesty. Yeah, well said. Yeah, th- this actually, I think, highlights uh, the, the need for this book to, to get it out there, to share it uh, with um, with Protestant friends, family, coworkers, uh, whoever um, we, we come into contact with. Um, to get more conversation going based on the facts. And really, um, there's only been one version of the facts in our times that most people are aware of, and it's and it's really the myth about Martin Luther. To, so to get into um, really getting to the facts of his life with a more objective uh, biography, which I would say this is, again, going back to 1581, much closer to the time of Luther, um, this is certainly at least something that that people ought to ought to read and contend with. Uh, this biography by James Lang, again newly translated by Father Robert Nixon, who we're talking with today, and you can get it at censusfidelimpress dot com, censusfidelimpress dot com. And so, um, w- w- is there anything that jumps out to you in um, in this biography, or, or anything else that you know of the facts of how things transpired from the time of? of Wittenberg and those 95 theses onward, um, where so much happened after, after that moment in Wittenberg, though that gets uh, really the, all the emphasis. Uh, so much happened afterwards that really just unraveled and, and, and led to, um, to where we are uh, today with, uh, with, with this terrible, terrible division upon division that really stems back to Martin Luther. But anything that you noticed in terms of the response of those who are responding to the uh, heretical teachings of Luther and the errors of Luther, where you look at it and you say, this could have been nipped in the bud, right? This could have maybe been put out early on. Instead, this thing kept rolling. Anything that you point to that um, it would be a lesson for us in how to respond um, I guess to um, to errors as they pop up or, or heresies as they're being proclaimed as a better way maybe to deal with them so they don't become bigger than what they are. Yeah, well, I think it, at the time it was difficult to deal with these things because, you know, communication was so difficult. There was not media and so forth to get news out there. A lot of the time people in Germany wouldn't have known what was going on in Rome, you know. Mm-hmm. So... But looking back on it, I think that it probably would have been appropriate for stronger action to be taken against Luther, um, either to completely prohibit him from publishing or to move him into some uh, administrative enclosed role to get him out of the scene. You know, and I think uh, this is something which has a resonance for our own days, you know, because there are uh, there's a lot of heretics in the world today even people who, you know, work for the church, and they, they go on publishing and, uh, and speaking and, and causing division. So um, I think the church really needs to, to be clear about what it believes and to be prepared at times to offend people a little bit because if you try to please everyone all the time, you end up departing from the truth and confusing everyone. And I think we sometimes see uh, that happening uh, in our own times. Yeah. And on the other end, too, I think there's a, a great lesson here for us in terms of just early on with uh, with Martin Luther. For instance, it says this in one of the early parts of the book. Um, it, it says that at about the age of 20, he obtained his master's degree. At this early point in his life, Martin had already experienced a considerable amount of praise and adulation on account of his success as a scholar, he had acquired a taste for this recognition and praise and felt that in respect to cleverness and intelligence, he easily excelled all of his peers. And so driven on by a thirst for personal advancement and fame and placing faith in his own abilities and ingenuity, 
He began to study law. It goes on from here, but you can get this sense, and we'll talk about it with Father Robert Nixon when we get back. You get this sense, um, this uh, the, the line that really jumps out to me is this taste, this a taste that he acquired for recognition and praise. Um, so even early on, the er, the early warning, the early lesson here is, okay, yes, be faithful in doing the good that you're called to do, and certainly uh, develop the skills that the Lord is calling you to develop, and all of that, but humility must be maintained. Humility must be the virtue in first place. Um, you cannot, you, you must be on guard in allowing yourself to acquire this taste for adulation. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Father Robert Nixon. He has translated this biography from 1581 by James Lang on Martin Luther. It's entitled The Devil's Bagpipe, The True Life of Martin Luther. We've been talking about it today. You can get it at censusfideliumpress.com, censusfideliumpress.com. And Father, I think you're a great person to uh, answer this question, not only because of your translation of this text, but also the one we had you on to talk with you about a couple of years ago, uh, the text by um, Thomas Akempis um, entitled Humility and the Elevation of the Mind to God. Uh, even in this biography of James Lang, um, even though it's damning in laying out the facts on Martin Luther in so many ways, there is still a certain recognition of his, of his gifts, of his skills, of his intelligence in some sense, in what he was able to accomplish at an early age and um, and and moving forward. However, obviously badly misused and abused the further you go into his story. And really this all stemming from this this great sin of pride. Um, any any lesson you can teach us on this to make sure that we um, we really receive the lesson and don't fall into uh, this pride ourselves in any way, but really um, walk away from this with all the more um, sort of motivation to say, I'm not going that way. I'm going the way of humility. Anything you can help us with there? Absolutely. So one of the aspects of pride is when we become, when we fall in love with our own opinions and our own judgments. Mm. And this can happen to such an extent that even when it becomes clear that our opinion or judgment might have been uh, somehow not correct, people often end up preferring to defend that just to make a point. And I think that there's a lot of that in, in Martin Luther. So for this reason, to be always ready to step back from one's opinions, not to, not to, not to stick to something just for the sake of sticking to it, this applies particularly for Catholics, you know, that we, we always, all of us, priests, lay people, we're in a process of ongoing education. So, you know, we could say, yes, we're, we're loyal to the teachings of the church and we do our best to understand them. But this is an ongoing process. And, you know, I often find people disagreeing about one thing or the other, uh, but, but they should recognize that the people with whom they are disagreeing are also creations of God and also have their own intelligence and wisdom and insights. So always to be prepared to, to look at yourself and say, you know, maybe I'm wrong. And uh, I think this is, this is a great step because it, it takes down our defense. It means we realize that we are not the final word in anything, that God is the final word. He is beyond our comprehension. Yeah, great stuff here with Father Robert Nixon. Again, you can get this book, The Devil's Bagpipe, The True Life of Martin Luther. Go to censusfideliumpress.com. Father, one of the things that also jumped out to me in reading this was how Martin Luther um, made this um, assertion that uh, the, the church had somehow stopped being the church um, in, in the apostolic age up until his time, and now he was going to kind of make it so um, and throwing out all of the saints and martyrs in the process from then until that point. And, um, and as you, as you entitle this, um, this biography, the devil's bagpipe, how he's really being used by the devil, um, in so many ways. And you see that in the bad fruits that come. Um, what about this in terms of, um, 
looking at him again as a warning and then and then looking to the lives of the saints that he tried to throw away and, and saying, look at these, look at the lives of the saints. They were in union with Jesus and his Catholic Church, trying to reach out to our Protestant friends, family, co-workers, and, and helping to make this argument to show them the difference between the example of Martin Luther and the example of, um, you know, fill in the blank with, with some holy saint that was actually obedient. Are there any saints that jump out to you that would be a great juxtaposition to lift up in, in comparison with Martin Luther in terms of the good example of how to really serve the Lord and bring forth the good fruits, anybody jump out to you that would be good for us to recommend uh, to uh, to any Protestant friends? Yeah, Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas was someone who I mentioned before, Luther really despised. But in his writings, Thomas Aquinas always recognizes um, and treats with respect the opposition point of view. And then with reason, and with reference to authorities, he comes to his own conclusions. But he always he always writes um, in a in a way which isn't offensive. He never attacks the person, and he always writes with an underlying humility that anything he writes he defers to the judgment of the church. And um, so I think when we read Thomas Aquinas, you don't this is a compliment to him, you don't get much of the personality of Thomas Aquinas. You you get the sense that he is doing a job. He's operating uh, as a kind of vessel for the truth. He's, he's doing his best to be a reasoned scribe. And that was what he saw himself as, not as a great teacher, not as a great, um, you know, philosopher or anything like that. He basically saw himself as a humble teacher of people in formation. And this contrasts so wonderfully with Luther. And at the end of his life, Thomas Aquinas sought above all silence and solitude. He wanted to get away from whatever fame and celebrity had come to be attached to him. So I think a perfect contrast to Martin Luther. Yeah, very, very helpful. Father Robert Nixon with us, The Devil's Bagpipe, The True Life of Martin Luther. Get it at censusfidelionpress.com. Father, before we hit that music here to end the show, can you can you grant us a um, a blessing now, if you would, and then also um, any final comments that you wish to share? Yeah, so I would uh, would encourage your listeners to, to to pick up a copy of this Census Fidelium book, also to check out all the other titles through Census Fidelium. We have another one out called the Theatre of Cruelty, which mm-hmm. describes. Uh, the atrocities committed against Catholics during the time of the Protestant schism. But I would also encourage you also be committed to the Catholic Church and be prepared to step back sometimes from your own opinion to defer to history, tradition, and so forth. I think we're here to learn from God, not to teach the world. The Church is here to teach the world, and that's bigger than any one of us individually. So may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Robert Nixon. And, uh, you know, this is another great episode. What is our goal here? Ongoing formation, ongoing conversion. Uh, Father Robert Nixon, a big help, I think, to us in that respect today. Um, I think we, we do have just one more minute, Father. So um, so any any final um, encouragement for us today uh, that, that, uh, that you have in mind? I would say, remember, we talked about the difference between the Lutheran and the Catholic point of view of human nature, that Catholics, we believe that we're fundamentally good, but we're impaired by the effects of original and personal sin. So I would encourage all Catholics Look within yourself, whatever your situation in life, discover the goodness which is at the heart of every human being created by God and let this goodness flourish. This is what Jesus Christ wants us to do. Become more and more like him who was, uh, along with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the one human being who was completely free of this effect of sin. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you, Father Robert Nixon, and uh, and dive deep into that sacramental life in, in doing exactly what Father Nixon is uh, encouraging us to do there, um, specifically the sacrament of penance, of confession. Um, Luther wanted to throw that one out. I do believe he only wanted to keep three sacraments and throw the rest out. I mean, imagine the, the pride and the gall of Luther in just trying to rewrite um, the, the the teachings of the Catholic Church that Jesus Christ died to give us. So let us receive the full treasure of God's um, blessing to us, Jesus's uh, gift to us in his Catholic Church. God bless you all.